I think it would be best then if we started at the broadest level and then moved into some more specific dimensions of your work. And you remain extremely well known for a two volume book you and David Rumelhart published in 1986 called Parallel Distributed Processing. And what is the general idea of parallel distributed processing as it's employed to explain cognitive function? So I think the idea came originally from an interest in understanding how when we perceive, when we think, when we understand language, when we just decide how to reach with our arm to pick up an object that's sitting on the table in front of us, um, we're always integrating multiple sources of information and um, although others you know liked to argue that some of these sources of information were primary and categorical it always seemed to me and David that um, they were all sort of graded constraints and that you know you could override any of them with other ones if they were strong enough there was no in principle reason why syntax had to be first, or something like that. And um, so we sought to build models where the interpretation of any element of sensory input could be understood as exploiting all of the potential um, constraints that other aspects of the input could impose, uh, as well as what you had learned about those constraints from your prior experience. And um, we studied this in particular initially in the context of um, perceiving letters embedded in other letters. So if you um, present someone with a sequence of letters extremely briefly on the screen and you ask them, to identify one of the letters, you point to the position that one of the letters occupied and you say, what letter was that one? And even you give them a forced choice between two alternatives that you've chosen carefully in advance, they will be better at identifying that letter if it's in a word than if it's by itself. And uh, this fact, uh, you know, is contra to a lot of different ways of thinking. It's like, well, wouldn't you have to identify the letters before you figured out what word it is? So why is it that the word, the fact that it's in a word could help you identify the letter? Um, So that's like why people found it interesting. And I actually started exploring that phenomenon myself in graduate school. But, you know, from the point of view of uh, continuous integration of partial evidence and um, synergistic combination of information from what you know about how letters get together to make a word, together with um, what the sensory evidence is that you have at your disposal, we were actually able to build a very simple model that captured this. Um, The model has neuron-like processing units in it for features of letters in each of the possible positions within a word, and then units for uh, letters that might be in each of those positions, and then units for words that span across multiple positions. And so when you see, um, for example, W-O-R, and you know there's one more letter, but you're not quite sure what it is, you know, a couple of words get activated in your mind. The word word itself and the word work are consistent with those first three letters. And if the bottom-up input is maybe um, consistent with a K or an R, but not with a D, your the network will sort of settle into a state where 
it's decided that this must be work and that final letter must be a K. And uh, we, with, with this little model, we were able to account for a, a wide range of data from experiments on you know, the perception of letters in words. Um, and we, we also discovered that we could account for the perception of letters in pronounceable non-words this way as well. So people see a letter in a pronounceable non-word better than they see it when it's by itself. And there wouldn't be a pre-existing unit for that pronounceable non-word. So um, uh, how could that work? Well, in our model, it worked very simply because it might partially activate a bunch of similar words that all sort of agreed about what that letter might be. So if you print it, if you present um, a letter string like M-A-V-E, um, it doesn't match any particular word, but it matches a lot of words that have M-A blank E and another bunch of words that have A-V-E, and they all sort of agree that that A and, and that E are extremely likely letters, and the M is actually reasonably likely with other letters in the V slot, and the V is reasonably likely with other letters in the M slot. And so this conspiracy of partially activated uh, units for familiar words sort of works together to support all the letters. Just to clarify then, the hypothesis that accounts for why it's easier to identify a letter when it appears in a word rather than when it is by itself is that the recognition that it's a certain letter is reinforced by units in the neural network that are already sensitized, so to speak, to words that contain that letter, or in the second example, to phonetic units that contain that letter? Um, well, I think, let me try to um, discuss this in a slightly different way. So, uh, well, let's imagine a situation where um, the information that you had from the visual input was incomplete, like maybe some features were obscured by blotches and you couldn't see all the letters properly. So um, in principle, you know, for each of the letters in the word, there would be a set of possibilities that would all be consistent with the input. And um, if you had a, a neuron for each of the possible letters at each of the possible positions in the word, this bottom-up input might activate, you know, let's say it could be an M or an N in the first position. So those are both partially activated and an E or an F in the second position uh, and or a, a D or a be in the last position, but, um, and so all those possibilities would be activated bottom up. But if the letters were all like competing with each other and they will, each of them is, you know, in each position, there's a couple that are equally consistent with the input. Um, you just have to sort of guess among them. But if there was a, another unit up above them, for the word, I don't know, um, Ned, somebody's name, then um, the N and the E and the D would all be activating that, but there might not be a unit for, you know, MFB um, or other combinations there. So when there's a familiar pattern across all the letters, the unit for that pattern can be activated even though you're uncertain about the identity of the letters in each of the positions. And then if that unit sends feedback to all of the letters that are in it saying, you know, when I'm active, you should be active, um, the system will be able to settle into this sort of mutually consistent state where the word Ned and the letters N, E, and D are all mutually activated. And um, that's your interpretation of this input. Um, 
So furthermore, if I then sort of put a masking field in, so I'm wiping out the actual bottom-up feature information that was supporting this, because these things are mutually supporting each other, they will sort of hang before the mind, if you don't mind the expression, in a for longer, and you'll sort of have this, they'll persist, and you'll be able to sort of like feel like you saw it better, for example, and also report the identities of the letters in it because they're still sort of hanging there in front of your, in front of your uh, mind's eye, if you like. So, so that's exactly how I thought about this model. And um, in the case of uh, the non-word example, it's not because it's a phonologically familiar pattern, but it's in our model, it's because it partially consistent with several words, each of which get partially activated, and then they feedback support for all the letters that are actually there, even though no one of the words by itself exactly matches the whole input. So that's a an interesting kind of situation where the the configuration of a as a whole has a sort of a quality of familiarity, even though it it's only partially similar to many things that are familiar. And and that I used to call that conspiracy of mental agents, you know, to capture the idea that all these little bits of knowledge that we have about several different words could sort of like work together to make something that isn't a perfect match to any of them, nevertheless seem like a you know a member of the set of possible things that might occur, or certainly more likely than a string of random uh, random letters that... Uh... So in order to make truly random sequences, you have to work very hard. We, we embedded letters in Qs, Xs, and Js to make sure that, you know, any other letter that was embedded with a Q, an X, and a J didn't make a meaningful... Uh, combination at all. Uh, and that really made it possible to see a huge advantage for pronounceable non-words or even unpronounceable ones that happen to partly match um, several different subsets of the letters in the word. One of my favorite examples was S-L-N-T, which has no vowels in it, so it couldn't actually be word, but slit and slat and slot are all words, and scent and so on are words, and so um, it resonates with lots of words and still uh, produces this facilitation effect relative to, let's say, an E embedded in a Q, an X, and a J. And I know that these are these are some very basic questions from you for you, but why is this parallel distributed? processing model thought of or called a, a connectionist model? Um, well, it's because the knowledge in the network is actually in the connections between the neurons and not sort of written down anywhere um, as a string of, like the, the unit for the word word is a unit for that word only in virtue of the fact that it connects to the letters W, O, R, and D. And um, its consequences for being able to uh, support perception of those letters are captured by the fact that it has connections back to those letters so that when it's activated, it activates the units for those letters. And so... Um, the entire basis for um, the word superiority effect that we've been talking about is the fact that there are units that have the, there's units for each of the words, but they're units for those words by virtue of the fact that they connect to the right letters. And so the knowledge is all in the connections. Hmm. And the idea is that even though something like this can be instantiated in silicon. The idea is that it's a much more simplified model for how the human brain works and how you think of 
hum- cognitive function in humans. Yeah. So um, we think of these units in our network as corresponding to um, it's a slightly abstract mapping. It's not like individual neurons or even separate populations of neurons, but patterns of activation across populations of neurons that are mutually exclusive alternative patterns of activation. And um, these patterns are, you know, compete with each other. Uh, in the same way that individual units can compete with each other through lateral inhibition and so on. And so it's possible to imagine, you know, an actual neurophysiological instantiation of these models. Although I've always felt myself that my own greatest interest was in making sure I'm making contact with the cognitive phenomena that I care about and not worrying so much about the neurophysiological implementation as such. But the key idea, what a really important idea is the bidirectionality and mutuality of these connections such that, you know, activity anywhere can potentially be uh, part of the context that determines the outcome of activity anywhere else in the network. 